The history of the first transatlantic telegraph cable is one of those technological achievements that revolutionized the world, but that few people knew about. Just imagine how difficult it was for the guys at that time to lay a cable across the Atlantic Ocean. It was around 1850. Morse's telegraph had already proven to be a very profitable business, and was radically changing the way American and European cities communicated. However, there was a problem. While cities on the continents communicated almost instantly, communication between Europe and America still depended on letters sent by ships, which took more than 10 days. They needed a submarine cable to be installed between the continents, eliminating this communication delay once and for all. This was a problem on the minds of many brilliant thinkers of the time, who were also eyeing the profit they would make by providing this service, of course. But, this was not going to be an easy task. Not at all. However, there are always the courageous ones, who in this story were the businessman Cyrus Westfield, who almost went bankrupt with this venture. Samuel Morse, who also invested a lot of money and time in the project. Engineers like Frederick Newton Gisborne, and important scientists such as Michael Faraday and William Thomson. And in this story, the word courage makes a lot of sense. Because what these people went through to achieve this, well, it required a lot of determination. In 1856, Cyrus Field led the formation of the Atlantic Telegraph Company. The company would be responsible for raising money for the venture by selling shares in England and the United States. Additionally, they received help from the British and American governments, which offered economic assistance and ships for the cable installation, in exchange for priority in sending messages. The task was monumental for the time, comparable to the mission that would take humanity to the moon. They would have to extend 3,200 kilometers of cable at depths reaching 4,000 meters. Besides having to design a cable of this size that could withstand the marine environment, corrosion, and water pressure, they also did not know what the electrical behavior of such a large cable would be. They had some notion from experiments in other locations, but not on this scale. There were already submarine cables installed in Europe, such as between England and France, for example. And before contemplating this feat of crossing the Atlantic, Cyrus Field himself had already constructed a 2,500 kilometer telegraph line between New York and Newfoundland, a project that allowed them to shorten the sending of messages between Europe and the United States by three days. This required them to lay a submarine cable of approximately 100 kilometers at this point. It was an experience they would use, but it was far from the 3,200 kilometers of the new project. In fact, it is worth highlighting the role of Cyrus Field in this story. He was the main visionary and responsible for this project, investing a large part of the fortune he made by founding a paper company years earlier, which allowed him to retire at the age of 33. Cyrus Field entered the telegraph line business in 1854, when Frederick Gisborne approached him to request an investment that would allow him to complete the construction of the telegraph line between New York and Newfoundland. That's how it started. Gisborne's project was to reach that point in Canada, but the costs became so high that he had to look for new investors. Cyrus Field spent the equivalent of $100 million in today's values to buy Gisborne's company and complete that part of the project in 1855. And since he didn't understand anything about engineering, he thought, why stop there? Why not extend the cable all the way to Europe? It was at this moment that he turned to the mission of building the rest of the line across the Atlantic Ocean. Seeking the help of Samuel Morse and others who understood the field, he founded the Atlantic Telegraph Company, which issued shares to raise money. Basically, these were the steps they had to undertake to carry out the venture. First, they had to design the submarine telegraph cable, of course, and carefully plan its route on the ocean floor. Having done that, knowing the cable's required length and specifications, they had to manufacture and plan the installation of this gigantic cable in the ocean. Would it be one ship? Two? Thanks to marine topography maps of the North Atlantic, they were able to plan the cable's route carefully. It would pass almost in a straight line between the coast of Ireland and Newfoundland in a relatively flat and shallow region compared to the rest of the ocean. Regarding the cable design, he sought the expertise of an English company that had already laid a telegraph cable across the English Channel in 1850. In fact, Cyrus Field appointed the owner of this company as the president of the Atlantic Telegraph Company. John Watkins Brett was one of the foremost authorities on submarine cables at the time. The cable developed to cross the Atlantic had seven copper wires covered with a layer of gutta percha, a type of natural resin extracted from a tree. Next, it was wrapped with tarred hemp and had an additional outer protective layer made of 18 cables, each with seven steel wires, which were spirally wound. Ignore these two rings here, as they are just to secure this unused cable sample. 
In fact, they sold hundreds of pieces like this from the leftover cable. Many people wanted a souvenir of this event. But, a side effect of all these layers of metal and insulation was that the cable became very heavy, weighing approximately 550 kilos per kilometer. Multiply that by 3,200 kilometer, and you have a load so large and heavy that no ship of the time could carry it. The solution was to divide the cable, which would be carried by two large warships accompanied by two smaller support ships. The USS Niagara provided by the United States, and the HMS Agamemnon provided by England both adapted for the task. These ships already had steam engines but spent most of the time using sails due to the inefficiency of the engines. And since the cable would be divided, two companies in England were contracted to have the manufacturing time. Another issue they had to decide was how the ships would install the cable. Would they go from one coast to the other? Or would they go to the middle of the ocean, splice the cables, and then split, with one ship heading each way? The moment of laying the cable was extremely delicate, especially with the technology of that time. If they encountered a storm or very rough seas, the ship could be driven off course, or a wave could lift the ship abruptly and stretch the cable until it broke. Remember that we are talking about a very heavy cable. Once a significant portion of it was on the ocean floor, it was quite easy for it to break if stretched abruptly. The option of sailing both ships to the middle of the ocean, splicing the cables, and then sailing in opposite directions would have the cable installation time, reducing their exposure to the terrible storms that often occur there. But the final decision was to go from one coast to the other, starting from Ireland. In 1857, the two parts of the cable were ready for installation and were loaded onto the ships in an operation that took three weeks. It was at this moment that someone noticed that the cables didn't fit. One company had built the steel wires with the spiral wound in the wrong direction. Hastily, a wooden device was constructed to make the new connection at sea. Problem solved. Let the attempts begin and you'll soon understand what I mean by attempts. On August 5th, 1857, the work began. They connected the cable on land and started laying it. At 8 kilometers from the coast, guess what? The cable got stuck in the machinery that was releasing it slowly and broke. Everyone returned to the coast. They then pulled in the 8 kilometer of cable, spliced it, and set off for another attempt, laying the cable and checking the telegraph signal being sent through it. This was how they knew if everything was working correctly. They spent five days laying the cable through a complex system of gears and brakes that regulated the release rate, controlled manually by observing the speed of the ship and the ocean currents. Then, on August 11th, a huge wave hit, lifting the ship and putting tension on the cable. Shouts began for the brakes on the machinery controlling the cable to be released. In the midst of the confusion, this did not happen, and the cable broke. 650 kilometers of cable sank to the bottom of the sea, and the operation was halted. During the winter months, the engineers began redesigning the machinery and training the crew. Scientists like William Thompson developed new measuring instruments and researched more about sending an electrical signal through such a long cable. And Cyrus Field spent the same period convincing investors and the public that the problems would be resolved and that a new attempt should be made the following year. He succeeded, and in June 1858, everyone set sail again but now with a different approach. This time, they would meet at these coordinates, connect the cable, and set off, each ship heading in opposite directions. But, and you thought it would be easy, the ships encountered a terrible storm along the way. For six days, the wooden ships carrying over 1,500 tons of cables were tossed around by enormous waves. The Agamemnon ended up off course by more than 50 kilometers. The crew of the USS Niagara thought they had sunk. In fact, Everyone thought they would end up at the bottom of the sea with the cables. It took days for them to meet at the designated point. Once there, the cables were connected and the ships departed. They laid approximately 100 kilometers of cable until the telegraph signal being sent from one ship to the other disappeared. The reaction on each ship was that the problem must be on the other end. So, the support ships on each side were sent to the meeting point to see what had happened. Once there, they discussed, analyzed, and didn't find the problem. Since they couldn't pull that heavy cable back up, they discarded the 100 kilometer of cable they had laid and started all over again. They spent two days laying the cable until, at midnight on June 29th, guess what? The cable on the Agamemnon broke and sank to the bottom of the Atlantic. Since they were hundreds of kilometers apart, the operation was canceled and everyone returned to Ireland. Undeterred, 
The Atlantic Telegraph Company, represented by Cyrus Field, ordered more cable and tried again the following year. And off they went again on July 17, 1858. This time the weather cooperated and everything went well. On July 29, 1858, the cables were joined and the two ships parted ways, reaching their destinations on August 5, 1858. Finally, the first transatlantic telegraph cable was installed, and this odyssey had apparently come to an end. Or had it? On August 10th, test messages were already being transmitted through the cable, and on August 16th, the exchange of messages between the Queen of England and the President of the United States officially inaugurated the line. I can only imagine their feeling when sending and receiving messages in seconds across an entire ocean. It must have been incredible. But the joy was short-lived. That's right, a few days after starting operation, the telegraph signal began to deteriorate. That 98-word message sent by Queen Victoria had already taken 16 hours to transmit, and after that, the signal only got worse. It was basically like this. The Queen is convinced that, and then the response would come back, what did you say? Repeat. This lamentable performance of the telegraph also intensified the conflict between two senior members of the project. The scientist Thompson, and the chief engineer Whitehouse. William Thompson was a theoretical physicist who would later be appointed by Queen Victoria as Lord Kelvin, responsible for creating the Kelvin temperature scale. He was the one who proposed the idea of laying the cable from the middle of the ocean, which turned out to be successful. Whitehouse was a physician by training and a self-taught expert in electrical machinery technologies. All his knowledge in this field came from practical experience. He was the advocate of the initial idea of laying the cable starting from the coast. Returning to the communication problem, Thomson argued that the cable was too thin and that the signal would be attenuated by what he called the law of squares, a mathematical equation he formulated. Thomson stated that the electric current of the telegraph signal reached its maximum value in a time proportional to half the square of the cable's length, resistance, and capacitance. The problem is much more complex than that, but at the time, it was the way he found to prove that the cable needed a larger copper diameter, better electrical insulation, and higher quality copper. Something that Whitehouse disagreed with, saying that the cable project was adequate, which pleased the company's executives who wanted to save on manufacturing costs. Because imagine, any change in the diameter of such a cable, which spans thousands of kilometers, would significantly increase the costs. Since the cable was already installed, there wasn't much that could be done. So Thompson tried to solve the problem by developing a better signal detector. He created a mirror galvanometer, which detected and amplified the weak signal received. This significantly improved communication, but it didn't completely solve the problem. Whitehouse, who didn't want to use Thompson's idea, decided to solve the problem by increasing the electrical signal voltage sent through the cable from 600 volts to 2000 volts. This worked briefly, as the electrical signal became stronger. However, by doing so, he ended up breaking the cable's electrical insulation and communication ceased just a few weeks after the inauguration, in September 1858. As soon as the news spread, since this story had been closely followed from the beginning, conspiracy theories began to emerge, claiming that it had all been a hoax. People suggested that Cyrus Field and his partners had done it to make money from selling shares on the stock market. What actually happened was that all the blame fell on White House, who was fired. Communications began to circulate again through letters, the American Civil War broke out, and everything remained at a standstill until 1866. Meanwhile, without Cyrus Field knowing, strong competition emerged on the other side of the country. An American named Perry Collins partnered with Western Union and the Russian government to install a telegraph cable that would connect the United States to Europe through Russia, avoiding the need to cross large bodies of water. They only had to span this 83 kilometer stretch here in the Bering Strait, which is 50 meters deep. And look at that! There's even an island in the middle of the route! Fortunately, Cyrus Field was unaware of this added pressure. With Thompson's help, a new cable was designed, much more robust and thoroughly tested underwater. He also commissioned a large steamship adapted for laying telegraph cables, the SS Great Eastern, which could carry the entire cable in one go. A ship that successfully completed the installation of a new transatlantic cable on July 27, 1866, unknowingly ending the plans of competitor Perry Collins. This new telegraph cable had a communication speed 80 times faster than the previous one, transmitting up to 8 words per minute. And from that day on, 
the two continents have never been disconnected. After that came submarine telephone cables and optical fiber cables, which today carry 99% of the data transmitted over the internet. Well, I'll stop here. Thank you for your company, and until next time, 